During the month of November, in the Divine Liturgy, the Church reads a good part of the book of Daniel, and as I've been reading it for the last couple of weeks, it occurred to me that he really is an interesting character in the Old Testament. And you might like to hear a little bit about him today, about Daniel. Most people don't know much about him, except the fact that he, he survived spending the night in uh, uh, the lion's den. He was miraculously preserved from being eaten. But he had a lot of other really interesting adventures, and he's a really colorful figure in Scripture. Most of what we know about him is in the book of Daniel, of which he was the, the human author. Uh, our story starts out with Daniel as a child being part of the, the royal family of Judah under King Joachim. Now, the kingdom of Judah was inv invaded by King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon around 590 B.C., and he conquered it, and he carried off some of the precious vessels from the temple. And he took some of the children of the royal family as hostages or as, as collateral for the peace treaty that he signed with the king of Judah. This was a practice that was very common in ancient times to take uh, the children of, uh, of an opposing king as collateral when you sign a treaty with him. And so this included Daniel and his three friends, named Ananias, Misael, and Azarias. They were mostly all, probably all children. And they were taken to the, the court of Nebuchadnezzar to be raised. And, and they were prisoners, it's true, but they were going to be raised in a manner suitable to, to royalty. And they were going to receive the highest possible education. And to, they were going to be groomed to be high-ranking ministers to King Nebuchadnezzar. When they got to Babylon, they were, they were going to be fed with the food from the king's table. But Daniel and his three friends had a problem with this because a lot of that food had been offered to idols. And so they told their, their guardian or, or their tutor that they didn't want to eat any of the meat or drink any of the wine from the, ta the king's table. But instead, they wanted to eat nothing but beans and water. So they were very mortified and very ascetic at the same time. But the, the tutor said, I can't let you do that because on a diet like that, you're going to end up weak and skinny. And when the king sees you looking like that, he's going to put me to death. And if you think that's a little bit extreme for this man to be put to death because a, a few kids are a little bit skinny... Just wait. In the, in the, if you read the book of Daniel, it is truly amazing how easy it was to get put to death for the slightest thing. And uh, the body count in this book is very high. And we'll see this again and again. But Daniel answered and said that he should just give them a chance. And if they lost too much weight, they could immediately switch back to the normal food. But after 10 days of living on beans and water... Daniel and his friends became the healthiest and the sturdiest and the strongest boys of that entire group. And they studied the learning of the Babylonians, and they, they received a very fine education. And Daniel was the smartest and the wisest man in the entire kingdom, on top of which God gave him the gift of prophecy. He stayed relatively unknown until one night when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that he knew was a prophecy, but he didn't know the meaning of the prophecy. He, uh, it was an allegorical vision that he had, he had received. <clears throat> and so he called in his wise men, and he told them that he had had a prophetic dream. And the wise men asked him what he had dreamed about, so they could interpret it for him. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, basically, if you truly have the gift of prophecy, you should already know what I saw in my dream. So why should I have to tell you? And if I just tell you what my dream is about, and then you, you give me an interpretation, how will I know that this interpretation you give me isn't just something you made up? And he said, the only way I'll know that your interpretation is correct is if you tell me both what I saw and also what it means. And, of course, if you can't tell me this, I'm going to put all of you to death. Because that was how it worked. 
And his position had a certain logic to it. And of course, the wise men couldn't tell him what his dream was about, and so the king had them put to death. And then he, he sent executioners throughout the entire kingdom to put to death all of the learned men in the kingdom. Well, when they got to Daniel, Daniel wanted to know why he was going to be put to death. And he was, he, they told him the story, and he said that he was able to interpret this dream that the king had. So he was brought into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar, and he told him both what he had seen in his dream and also what it meant. And it was a prophecy about the future of, of his kingdom and eventually of the coming of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> And the king was so impressed and so happy that he made Daniel one of the most powerful men in his whole kingdom. Now, unfortunately, he didn't persevere in, in these, these good intentions that he seems to have had, because a short time after this, he made a statue of himself, made of gold. And the Bible says it was 75 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And he commanded that everyone worship it every time they heard music being played in the streets. And of course, needless to say, anyone who didn't worship the statue when the, the music was played in the street would be put to death. Okay, that's a solution to every problem. This story might be familiar to you because it's read on Holy Saturday every year. It's the last of the 12 prophecies that are read uh, on Holy Saturday. Now the commentators say that the statue was probably gold-plated so that it looked like gold because a statue of, of solid gold 75 feet high would be very difficult, if not impossible, to make for various reasons. But the king decreed that, of course, uh, anyone who didn't worship the statue would be thrown into a furnace and burned up. So when the statue was built, Daniel and his, his three friends, Ananias, Misael, and Azarias, refused to worship it. That would be an act of idolatry. So the ministers of the king were too afraid to arrest Daniel for his, his refusal but, because he was, he was uh, the high, one of the highest men in the kingdom. But they arrested his three friends and dragged them before King Nebuchadnezzar. And he commanded them to be thrown into the furnace. And he was so angry that he ordered the furnace to be heated to seven times hotter than it was designed for. And for them to be thrown in and the the fire was so great that scripture says that flames shot 75 feet into the air above the furnace. And when the executioners opened the door to throw the men in, the flames blasted right out the door and killed the executioners as they, they threw those men in. And anyone else who got too close also was killed. But the three young men were not harmed at all inside the furnace, and instead it says that the flames fell to them like a cool, misty breeze. Nebuchadnezzar came along a little bit later to see how things were going, and he looked inside the furnace, and he said that he saw four men walking around inside. And he said, I thought we threw three men in here, and why do I see four? And the fourth one has the appearance of the Son of God. And it was, it was clearly an angel that was protecting these three men from, from being burned. <clears throat> so he had them brought out of the furnace, and he told them that they could worship their God in the future without any more interference. And as an added bonus, he guaranteed them that every tribe and people and tongue which shall speak blasphemy against the God of Ananias, Azarias, and Misael, shall be destroyed and their houses laid waste, for there is no other God that can save in this manner. There are a few other stories about Nebuchadnezzar receiving prophecies, which he brought to Daniel for interpretation. Most of them were about political events going on at the time. And ultimately, it seems like he was converted to the true faith because of this, this gift of prophecy of Daniel. But he died shortly afterwards before he was able to release all the Jews to go back to, to their homeland. <clears throat> he was succeeded by his son, Balthazar, who unfortunately was a terribly pagan and evil man, but who came to a very dramatic end. And this is a very famous story. One day, he made a feast with his nobles, 
and they were they were reveling in in the banquet hall, and he, he became intoxicated, and he ordered that the sacred vessels that had been stolen from the temple in Jerusalem should be brought in to be used to drink wine at the feast. And as he was reveling with his nobles, suddenly a hand appeared floating in the air in the banquet hall, and it wrote three words on the wall. And the three words were, Mane Tekel Fares. And King Balthazar was terrified, as you can imagine, but he didn't know what the words meant. He brought in his wise men, and they couldn't figure it out either. And finally, his wife said that his father had had a wise man named Daniel, who was good at this kind of thing, who was more or less living a retired life at this point. He was keeping a low profile. But they brought him in, and Daniel looked at the words on the wall, And he made a speech chastising King Balthazar for his pride and his idolatry. And he said, this is the interpretation of the word. Mane, God hath numbered thy kingdom and hath finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting. Fares, thy kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes and the Persians. And at the very moment in which he was speaking these words, King Darius of the Persians, with his nephew Cyrus and their entire army, were sneaking through the drainage pipes of the Euphrates River into the city of Babylon. And they they took the city that same night and slew Balthazar and took over his kingdom. And Darius the Persian became king of Babylon. And this story has become a byword. If you've ever heard the expression, to see the writing on the wall, that's where it comes from. So Darius became king of Babylon, and he appointed Daniel to be one of the governors in his kingdom. And he was the best governor in the whole kingdom. And he was, of course, the favorite of the king. He was was the most competent. And the other ministers of the king became very jealous of this, and they decided they wanted to railroad Daniel for something, but there was nothing they could accuse him of. His, his character was beyond reproach. So they tried to get him in trouble for his religion, and they went to King Darius, and they suggested that he make a law that nobody could pray to anyone except the king for the next 30 days. And, of course, the punishment for breaking this law was going to be death. And King Darius didn't know the real reason why they wanted this, but it sounded okay to him. So he signed off on it. <clears throat> of course, Daniel just continued saying his own prayers privately to the true God. He said them in his, in his room. But the ministers spied on, on Daniel very closely until they were able to look through his window and see him kneeling in prayer in his room. And then they dragged him before the king and, and accused him. Well, the king didn't want to put Daniel to death, but... He didn't want to go against this law that he had passed. So he very reluctantly ordered Daniel to be thrown into a den of lions. But the king was so worried about Daniel that he couldn't eat or sleep for the entire night. And first thing the next morning, he he ran down to the lion's den. And he was overjoyed to find out that God had preserved Daniel from being eaten by the lions. They hadn't touched him at all. And he had Daniel brought out of the, out of the den, which was a, a deep pit in the ground with the lions at the bottom. And then, of course, he threw Daniel's accusers into the lion's den along with their families. And it says in Scripture that they didn't even hit the ground on their way in because the lions caught them in their teeth and immediately ate them up. <clears throat> there are a few other interesting episodes in the book of Daniel. I'll just tell one or two more. There was one time when he found out about a pagan temple in which there was an idol of a god named Bel, which supposedly ate a huge amount of food every night. Every night, the, the pagan priests of this temple would put a huge amount of, of meat and bread and wine in this temple, in front of this statue. And every morning it would all be gone. And the king worshipped this idol, and he noticed that Daniel didn't. 
And he asked him, why not? And Daniel said that it was just a statue. And the king said, how can you say that this, this is just a statue and that it's not alive? Don't you see how much food this thing eats every night? And Daniel said, that statue is just brass filled with clay. It has never eaten anything. Well, the king got annoyed at this, and he called in the, the pagan priests in, of this idol. And he said he wanted to know what was happening to all the food that they put in that temple every night, whether the idol was really eating it. And he said that he was going to find out who was right, whether it was Daniel or these pagan priests. And needless to say, whichever side turned out to be wrong was going to be put to death. So Daniel and the pagan priests both agreed to this test. And that evening, they put all the food in the temple as usual. But Daniel sprinkled a very fine layer of ashes all over the floor of the temple after the pagan priests had walked out so that they didn't see him doing this and they didn't know it was there. Now the pagan priests had a secret trap door in the floor of, of the, the temple underneath this idol and what they had been doing the whole time was coming through this trap door in the middle of the night and eating up all the food so that in the morning the food was all eaten. So they closed the door of the temple and the king put his seal on it so they would know if anyone had gone in. And the next morning, they went back to, to look inside, and sure enough, all the food had been eaten up as usual. And the king got very angry, and so he was just about to put Daniel to death when Daniel told him to look at the floor. So the king looked at the floor, and he saw a bunch of footprints all over the floor in the ashes. And he realized that it had been a trick, and so he forced the pagan priest to show him how they had managed to do this, and they showed him the trap door. And then the king had, had them all put to death, and he, he let Daniel to tear down the, the temple and destroy the idol. A little bit later on, there was another temple where the pagans worshipped some sort of large snake or, or dragon of some kind. And Dan, the king said to Daniel, well, surely you can't deny that this, this god is alive, so you should worship this thing. And Daniel said, I bet you that I can kill this snake without even using a weapon. And the king gave him permission. And Daniel got a bunch of tar and, and pitch, and he boiled it into a big, really thick, sticky blob. And he shoved it down the snake's throat and choked it to death. So between this incident and the previous one, the, the pagan priest got so angry that they went to the king and they threatened to overthrow the entire government if he didn't let them put Daniel to death. And he was afraid of, of this happening, so he, he agreed to it. And these pagan priests took Daniel and they threw him into a lion's den. And you might be wondering why they would try something like this again after what happened last time. But you have to remember that the people who had gotten Daniel thrown into the lion's den the first time, they weren't around anymore. And this, this incident was many, many years after the first time. But this time he was there in the lion's den for six whole days, and God saved him again miraculously until the king finally came and let him out. And then, of course, he threw in all the, the pagan priests into the, into the lion's den, and they got eaten up. The book also contains accounts of, of various visions and, and prophecies that he received. And the most interesting of all is the, the prophecy that gives the exact date of the, the coming of our Lord into the world, almost 500 years ahead of time. And it, it prophesies what year he would begin his public life and what year he would be put to death. And of course, they were fulfilled perfectly. It's uh, one of the most striking proofs of our holy faith. I, I don't have time to explain all of it right now. Maybe I'll, I'll get into it this Advent, hopefully. Um, but I think we have a lot more in common with Daniel than we realize. Just like him, we're, we're trying to be faithful to the true God, and we're really living in exile among pagans in, in a very similar way that he was.
And we should look at how he never swerved from his holy faith, even in the face of the greatest persecution. But he did his duty to his king and his God, and he trusted in God. And God delivered him from one terrible crisis after another. And we should have that kind of trust in God, too. And we should be not so afraid of of being persecuted by the pagans. And remember what is is most important of all is that we stay faithful to, to the true God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.